Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, where we're going with this, um, this is an outline for the next um, 45 minutes or so. Um, I, I'll introduce the series of webinars in a moment and a little bit about us as a, a climate change team of specialists within Natural England. And we'll talk a bit about trends in greenhouse gas emissions and climate, then go on to look at the impacts on the natural environment. Then an introduction to how we respond to the risks that climate change poses to the natural environment. And then we'll, um, we'll have some questions and discussion and we will aim to finish promptly by 12.15. And as Sarah said, yeah, if you can use your questions on the chat facility, uh, that, that helps us to manage it a bit better with large numbers. So um, this is the first in a series of four webinars to introduce uh, climate change in the context of biodiversity and ecosystems. And today we'll be very much looking at impacts of climate change um, and just introducing um, the topic. As we go through the next three weeks, however, we are going to be looking at, um, I suppose, more of the how we respond. What do we do about it? So uh, adaptation for nature conservation, particularly uh, next week, followed by nature-based solutions for net zero. So how the natural environment can tr contribute to um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then finally, looking at nature-based solutions to help people adapt to climate change uh, and to cope with the consequences of that. So uh, this is just the start. And in some ways, the really important stuff comes over the next three weeks. So, uh, so um, stick with us. Um, why are we doing this now? Well, partly, um, it did seem a good opportunity for some and I know not for all, but for some people, um, you know, locked down at home, uh, there is a chance to reflect and to, to study a bit more, perhaps, um, when they can't get out and about and, and doing their usual job. Obviously, we understand that for other people, you know, it's a very hard time. Um, but, you know, where we are able to take the opportunity, it seems good to do that. But there's another driver for holding it right now, which is the fact that we... Um, We've just published our new climate change adaptation manual um, just a week or two ago, uh, which we've done jointly with the RSPB. And um, it, it's partly to mark that. And uh, that, that's a, a resource that you can go to to find out a lot more about how to adapt to climate change. You won't want to read it all from start to finish, but it's, a, it's, a, it's more of an encyclopedia to dip in and out of. Um, also, as this is the first call, or the first webinar in this series, I did just want to introduce um, my colleagues to you as well. So I, I'm Mike Moorcroft. That's me in the middle at the bottom there on the screen, um, Principal Specialist for Climate Change. But uh, this is very much a team effort with, uh, with my colleagues that you can see there on the screen. And um, we'll introduce the different members of the team as we go along. Sarah, you've already heard. Sarah's organizing and chairing the call today. But uh, I, I just did some sums yesterday, which slightly scared me to discover that between us, we've got about 140 years experience of uh, environmental science, policy and practice, and, and 75 of those on, are on climate change. And we also seem to have published a lot of papers and reports. So um, hopefully we've, uh, we've learned a bit in that time, which we'd, uh, we'd love to share with you in this month. <coughs> Okay, let's go on to the substance of, of, um, of the webinar then. So first of all, I want to look at trends in emissions of greenhouse gases and climate. And this slide comes from the last big intergovernmental panel on climate change assessment report from 2013, still largely current. Um, it's a map of the world, obviously. And this compares temperatures in different places um, in the, the 2000s with uh, what the temperature was like at the end of the 19th century. And if it's red, it's warmer than it was then. And um, the picture is quite startling. Everywhere is warmer, 
some places, particularly um, in the northern polar regions, very much warmer. Where we are in the UK, we're about a degree warmer than we were um, in that period. And the evidence for that is really very clear. We also know a lot more now about what would have happened in terms of warming of the climate or changing climate if we hadn't had greenhouse gas emissions from people. And the, the, um, the graph you can see there was one produced and published in Carbon Brief, a good uh, climate news website, um, um, a year or two ago. And that shows what the, um, the actual trend in temperature is. That's the gray line. What it would have been if you only take into account um, natural variations, natural factors, uh, volcanoes, sunspots, and so on, um, and that's the blue line at the bottom, which essentially is flat with some, some downward um, ticks. Um, and then what it would have been if you just put the human factors in, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's the red line, and the message there is really clear that actually, although natural variations cause some fluctuations year to year and over periods of a few years, the overall upward trend can only be satisfactorily explained by the rising greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And it's not just rising temperatures, there's a whole lot of uh, knock-on consequences for that. And as we talk more, we'll, we'll talk more about those consequences. But some of them are more important in some ways for the natural environment than temperature per se in many places. So um, this is Arctic sea ice in summer. Um, and you can see that over the period from um, the start of the 20th century through to um, this, the start of this century, you can see that the area of Arctic sea ice has been going down um, on average. Um, the melting of the polar ice caps is a trend that's being seen quite clearly. And that has consequences. It's important in its own right in polar regions, but it's also important globally. Um, and we're seeing a rise in sea level largely a result of, of two factors, the, the melting of the ice and also a, a, of a thermal expansion, expansion of water with warmer temperatures. But um, there's a very clear trend now of, of rising sea levels. So what's likely to happen into the future? And um, this, these are projections. Um, there are more recent results since then, but the, the picture is broadly the same. But uh, going into the future, and again, it's another of these graphs I've been showing. We're showing um, time along the horizontal axis, in this case from, the, from 1950, going up to the present day, roughly speaking, which is the, the vertical line, um, and then looking at what might happen in future. And you can see this graph shows two different tracks. One uh, levels off, and that's the blue one, and then one that carries on climbing, which is the, the red one. And really, these are two extremes of, of what might happen in terms of our success as a, as a human race in reducing emissions. If emissions go on increasing um, at the high sort of level they are at the moment, then temperature will go on rising. And we're looking then at, at temperatures that could be globally um, four degrees or more um, by the end of this century. If we could stop emissions almost entirely um, promptly, then we would see them level out um, about um, 2050, something like that. And uh, we're, we're still there, really, at, you know, what's in some ways the best case scenario, talking about one and a half degrees of warming compared to um, pre-industrial levels. So there's a, uh, that's, that's a really key piece of background for everything we're going to talk about, really, as we go on over the next month. We do have a choice about um, what's likely to happen, although it's, it's not an easy one. 
as we'll see. Now let, let's bring it back to the UK, and I guess most people on this call are going to be UK based, um, if not everyone. And again, we have those two different scenarios. They're called representative concentration pathways. Um, I'm not going to explain fully what they are, um, but the low one, 2.6, um, indicates uh, a relatively small amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere uh, from here on. The high scenario uh, is a relatively high one, and that's probably as much as you need to know to understand these graphs. Um, at the moment, emissions are probably tracking closer to the high emission scenario, but the, the, there's a lot of detail behind the scenarios there that you, you know you can look into if you want to. But we're, we're going to focus more on the impacts rather than the climate science for these calls. But you can see still for the UK, um, if we carry on um, on the present uh, track, we are are going to see ongoing warming of a degree or so. Um, if we don't level off, then uh, the emissions, it goes on getting a lot higher. Now, I just want to move on to look at rainfall, precipitation. Um, and the interesting thing here for the UK, and this is something that we, um, that we know with less confidence, we know with temperature, um, but nevertheless, there's a consistent pattern in the climate model for the UK that shows a trend towards it becoming wetter in winter and drier in summer. And the higher the amount of emissions, um, the bigger the amount of climate change, the more pronounced that trend becomes. Um, doesn't mean every year it's going to have a dry summer and every year it's going to have a wet winter, but it means there is an ongoing um, uh, direction of travel there that, that uh, we're trying to be um, prepared for. And for the UK, for sea level rise, um, uh, and this is also from the UK, I should say these are both, the last few slides have been from the UK climate change projections, uh, so okay, so-called so UK CP18 projections published in 2018. Um, we can see at the higher rate of um, of climate change, we're looking for sea level rise going up um, to of the order of a, a meter, um, and some models are showing um, a bit more than that as well. So we, we're looking at quite significant rises in sea level, and they're not uniform around the, the UK coast. This is the little map on the right-hand side of the uh, screen that you can see here. And you can see in the southern part of the British Isles, the, the sea level rise is, is higher, indicated by the yellow symbol, uh, than it is in, in Scotland and the north. Um, the reason for that is the, the what's called isostatic readjustment of the land surface following the last ice age. So um, the UK is tilting slightly with the uh, and it's very slight, but the the, uh, the south is just slightly rising up. Um, oh, sorry, the, uh, the south, the, sorry, the north is rising slightly more than the south, um, which, which is sort of counterbalancing the rising sea level. But the bottom line is, we've got to be prepared for rising sea level, um, and the, the impact is likely to be bigger in the south than the north. Um, just a little bit about recent temperatures. Um, the, the trend in temperature does vary quite a lot from year to year. And th these are uh, Met Office data on, on temperature for England and rainfall for England. Um, so, you know, we, we mustn't assume that every year is going to be a, uh, one particular climate. It will still go on changing year to year in the future as it, as it has done. But the upward trend uh, starts to become apparent. Um, and we have seen a number of really very hot years and also some quite dry years. Um, and that combination of a hot summer and a dry summer, uh, like we had in 2018, um, can have quite big ecological consequences, which is worth bearing in mind as we go on through this talk. So there's also evidence of changes in the frequency of extreme events, and extreme events are used in a general sense, um, extreme weather events. 
uh, we can see particularly good evidence that um, there are more heavy rainstorms now than there were in the past. Um, that's that, the figure you've got in front of you on the right at the top. And um, there's a reason for that. In, with a hotter atmosphere, it holds more water. So when it rains, it rains heavier. And this was something that was always a possibility or a probability, but it's only really in the last few years that the evidence that actually happened is becoming clearer. That, of course, starts to have consequences for flooding, for flash flooding. Uh, combine that with wetter winters as well, and you can see the, the risk that we're looking at in, in terms of flooding. Not just flooding, um, hot, dry summers uh, can increase the risk of wildfire, which again was something we did see in 2018. So another risk to be prepared for. So let's, um, let's sum all of this up. What are we having to deal with? Uh, I guess a lot of us on the call work for a conservation organization, a lot of colleagues from Natural England, but we've also got a lot of our partner organizations uh, staff joining, which is great. Um, but I think you know, we share a co common challenge. It's not just about warmer temperatures, although those are important, but it's also this change in rainfall patterns, dry summers, wetter winters, heavier rainfall, increasing risks of drought, flood and wildfire. On the coast, increased risk of coastal erosion and saline intrusion. And then we're getting progressively into more indirect impacts, but can be equally important. So changes in pests and diseases, for example, changes in world markets, if you can't grow um, the same crops in the same place. Changing policy responses, um, also becoming a driver. Uh, seeing that a lot at the moment with a drive towards more tree planting. And also something that I think people um, uh, sometimes get a little bit flawed by, also increasing uncertainty. And people sometimes say, you know, well, that's kind of a reason not to do anything. Actually, I think quite the opposite. Increased uncertainty is increased risk in its own right in terms of how we manage, uh, manage the land, manage ourselves. So actually adapting to that increasing uncertainty is also a really important part of what it means to tackle climate change. So let's move on to the, the natural environment and what impacts we're having. And um, still probably one of the easiest and yet authoritative uh, sources of uh, information on the impact of climate change on UK biodiversity is this, the UK climate change Biodiversity Report Card deals with terrestrial and freshwater systems, last published in 2015. Um, you, if you Google it, you can find it. Um, it was my pleasure to, um, to, to chair the group that developed that. And we were able to say with some confidence that the, the headline message on this slide, that there is strong evidence that climate change is affecting UK biodiversity. Uh, and some of the impacts that we're seeing, and I'll talk through a little more, are summed up here. So species moving northwards, spring coming earlier in terms of events like flowering and nesting, changing populations, communities and habitats, the balance between species, changing in interactions with, um, with other variables, and also the impact of extreme events like droughts heat waves and um, floods. So one that people always talk about in this context is the fact that species are moving northwards. And really, it is a very large proportion of, or large number of species. Um, but it's not uniform. There are some winners and losers. So many butterflies are moving northwards. Uh, yeah. Some of the new squares colonised by uh, the peacock butterfly in the map that's on the screen at the moment. Um, many butterflies are moving north, but not all. Uh, so um, the mountain ringlet butterfly, uh, uh, well, probably our only real true mountain um, butterfly species in the UK, uh, does show signs of losing colonies at lower altitudes because of warming. Um, 
we're also seeing some of the other uh, insect groups moving northwards as well. So the, the small red-eyed damselflies colonize and spread through the country. Many of the plants are not moving so fast. Um, and it's, uh, it's worth bearing in mind that it, different groups do respond at different rates. And I just want to show you this um, sequence of slides now. I've moved on to look at the range expansion of the silver spotted skipper. This is a, um, a species of butterfly that occurs um, in the south, really, just got a toehold here. And this is looking at the South Downs area. Back in 1982, there were just a handful of them, of the handful of sites they were present on. And as we go through time, through 2000 and, and into this century, you can see it gradually colonizes and spreads. Now, in some ways, this is a filling out of the range rather than um, colonizing new territory. Uh, you can see it's picking out the chalk grass on there in, in the um, picture. Um, but it's certainly part of an aspect of uh, of what colonization and increasing in space as a result of climate change looks like. Uh, this is just some data from uh, John Denny, a colleague at the University of Exeter. So some of those species that show little change in distribution, um, just to briefly go back to that, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, so it's, there are some species in the UK with a wide climatic tolerance. If, if they're well within their climatic limits in the UK, we wouldn't expect to see much change when that's the case. But we can also see that in some cases it's a matter of slow dispersal, um, species that can't move. So many of the plants, the potential to colonize new ground is quite uh, low, not by any means all. Um, but it's interesting acts as well with slow rates of reproduction, so particularly with plants. Um, dispersal occurs at the seed stage very often, so if you don't produce a lot of wind-borne seeds, your potential to spread is very small as well. But there's also the issue of the fragmentation of our landscape, and um, it's easier to move when you have uh, a consistent cover of suitable habitat. And finally, I did, one of the things that we We'll come back to next time as well. It's the concept of refugia. There are some places where actually species can hang on much better than others um, within um, within our landscape and within the context of climate change. So you can see this is a national scale, and um, this is work done with Andy Suggett, and he's did a report for us. And then we've we've also had a joint paper published looking at where we can find climate change refugia, places where species hold on much better. And these are the cold places, uh, the places where there's relatively stable management um, and where the impacts are less. And you can see this nationally, so um, things like the spring gentian, which occurs in the North Pennines. At, um, this picture was taken at Upper Teesdale, really famous site for its, um, it, its rare upland species. Um, and you can see that also comes out quite well, the North Pennines, uh, as a, a refugial area, somewhere where species can, can survive. But it also occurs at a more local scale as well. So just the, the variation in the topography of a landscape, north facing slopes um, can be a degree or two colder, sometimes more um, compared to a north face. Yeah, north facing slopes can be a degree or two colder or more than south facing ones. So that's something that we'll come on to think about a bit more next time, but how we can take advantage of that when we're trying to adapt to climate change and, and minimize the risks. It's not all about changes in distribution, though. It's also changes in life cycle, so-called phenology. Um, and uh, well, there's a photograph here of my first bluebell of the year um, on Easter Sunday, 5th of April, um, near where I live. And I, I always thought of bluebell as a kind of late April going into May sort of species. Um, but some years we're, we're finding it's really uh, a good deal earlier than that. And that forms part of a trend. Um, so uh, 
this is a study that I, I still like to refer to from 2010, which was of 725 species or groups of species in the UK uh, across freshwater, terrestrial, and marine systems. And something like 84% of recorded species did show a trend towards things happening earlier in the spring. And the mean trend was nearly two weeks, about 12 days. But there were differences between species, which, which can be important as well in terms of the interactions between them. So if we're getting changes in the way organisms are operating and the way they're distributed, we would expect to see a change in the balance between them and to start to see a change at the community level. And we are starting to see that. And the, the signal for that has come out a bit more slowly, but this is work by um, Tom Oliver working with us. Uh, Tom's at the University of Reading. Um, showing the proportion of cold adapted species uh, within the bird community. And you can see that over time, from the 1960s through to uh, the start of this century, there's a trend towards proportionally fewer cold adapted bird species um, at, at the site that uh, were um, within, the, within the UK. So you can see a sort of tilting of the balance um, towards um, warm adapted species doing relatively well, either maintaining themselves or, or increasing in some cases, but, all, but the cold adapted ones tending to decline. Similar pattern in, in the ocean um, and um, some long-term records of plankton from the Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation. And they find, they're starting to find a trend, for example, between these, these two species towards the uh, a shift from the cold adapted to the warm adapted species. Uh, there's an increasing number of, of, of uh, pieces of evidence um, showing this. It's all obviously very consistent with what we'd expect given the warming climate that we've had. Something where we're also starting to get new evidence is around uh, whether species can adapt in evolutionary terms, in genetic terms, to a changing climate. And there is evidence now that this is happening in some cases. Um, so in terms of uh, microbes with very fast generation times, there's potential for that to, to actually happen quite quickly, but other much more uh, slowly reproducing species like this big old oak tree, um, you, you know, the chances of keeping pace with climate change are, are, are really just next to none. Um, so it would be a part of the component of how um, ecological communities respond to climate change. But um, except for very fast evolving species, uh, it's going to be a fairly minor one relative to the pace at which the climate changes is changing at the moment. Summing some of this up in terms of looking for some generalizations, we can see that some habitats are particularly vulnerable to change. Um, now that's not to say that some individual species may not be vulnerable in other habitats, but where the whole habitat itself is particularly vulnerable, we can see that there are particularly clear risks for montane habitats, those of the highest land. And I don't really mean the sort of general uplands. I do mean the highest altitudes in England, certainly, um, with species which are really adapted to Arctic alpine conditions. And They've got nowhere to go to, essentially, um, not in England anyway. They're very much out there, just hanging on at their climatic limits in the first place, um, and relatively small areas on mountain tops in places like the Lake District. Scotland, if I can briefly mention it, um, it, it does have a little bit more capacity there with a larger area of land at higher altitude. But we can also see there are threats to other habitats and wetland systems um, because of the potential for changes in, um, in water supply are at risk, at least in some places, particularly in the, um, the south and east. And um, 
also coastal habitats with rising sea level. And uh, w w one of the uh, most memorable times for me was going on a field visit to, um, to Norfolk following the 2013-14 winter, which some of you may remember was an extremely wet one, an extremely stormy one. And th this is the car park at, um, at Salt Houses. And the Shingle Ridge at Salt Houses had physically moved, um, moved inland by tens of meters. Um, uh, and it, it, you know, it's uh, it's there. You see change, you know, really in your face. And coasts have always been dynamic systems. This kind of thing does happen, but there is an overall trend towards losing land um, as the sea level rises, and and where it can do um, coastal habitats moving back inland. This is something we'll come back to next week. Um, because the problem there is often not that the system can't adapt, but actually hard sea defences prevent it migrating further inland. And again, I'm setting up uh, next week a bit here. Um, there are interactions that we can see with management. So there are tantalising things that we see, that, for example, protected areas our FSSIs are good places for species to persist, and they're also colonized by expanding species quite well. So there is a kind of glimmer of hope. I mean, I wouldn't want to push it too far, but if we have habitats and sites in good condition, it makes life that much better for species. The, uh, the, the flip side, of course, is where they're degraded and where habitats are very fragmented. Um, there is greater vulnerability, and, and we we do have evidence of that now. That, that in more degraded sites, more fragmented sites, the impacts can be rather more. So all of that does add up to the potential to build resilience and to adapt. And it depends, I think, if you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person on that one. You, um, you know, whether really. <laughs> The key message is that we're in such a bad way, or an even worse state, because our ecosystems are in such a bad way, or whether you look at the potential to restore them and, um, and build resilience. Um, that's one perhaps to reflect on, and we'll come back to next week. Um, I did just want to mention marine systems specifically. A lot of what I've been talking about has been um, terrestrial. Um, but there are, an, there are a number of common features with marine systems, particularly rising temperatures leading to changing distributions, and you can see um, species being recorded further northwards. Um, but there are some other ones. So um, I do uh, commend to you, if you want to know more, to look at the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership website and their series of report cards, which they've produced as good summary reports. Um, and they, these do show that uh, it's not just about rising temperatures, but there, there are things around reducing oxygen, acidification as well as um, carbon dioxide particularly dissolves into the sea, um, sea level rise, of course, and, and a range of impacts on food webs and different parts of the marine system. So looking ahead, um, We've done some work uh, over the last few years with partners on um, the risks and opportunities that lie ahead for species in Britain, um, in, in England particularly, obviously in our case. And this is work um, led by James Pierce Higgins at the British Trust for Ornithology working with us, um, in which we set out to model the change in potential distribution of different species um, uh, across a really very large number, several hundred species that we have very good data for. And you can see an example here, the willow tit, um, which is a species where um, actually it can expand its range and, um, and increase across the UK and, and the sort of northward drift. But um, that's another resource to look out for. 
I want to step back now just from the UK and, and look at the global perspective. And I've just put a couple of slides on here. And um, these are ones which probably require a little concentration and quite a complicated figure, but it's very data rich. And uh, it's worth just spending a minute or two on this. Um, so this was something that came from a report produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2017. And it's looking at impacts and risks for a range of different systems, not just natural ones, but, um, but, but they're well represented. And what, what we have are a number of example systems um, along the, the horizontal axis. And then if you look going upwards, you can see there's a series of bars. It's what's called burning ember diagrams, which the, uh, the colors are kind of, um, kind of reflect that. And um, you can see where, um, where it's white, all is well. Where it's yellow, it's starting to be a concern. Where it's red, it really is a concern. The risk is large. And then by the time you're getting into purple, um, it, it, it's looking you know, fairly catastrophic. And so how high up the bar you are reflects the level of temperature rise. So you can see those lines marked off showing one 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. And you can see for each of these systems, uh, uh, for those different uh, levels of warming, what the level of risk is. So on the left hand side, warm water corals, we're already at nearly a degree. And you can see they're already in quite serious trouble. And, and that's, those are well reported um, pieces of evidence that are at. Uh, at present day situations, we're already losing coral. Um, and you can see going into the future, it's a very grim picture, even if we manage to hold global warming to about one and a half degrees. In contrast, if you look at the mangroves, which is the next one along, um, they're doing fine at the moment in terms of their climate. They can be damaged by, um, by other factors, by, by human degradation, clearance, um, changing shoreline management. But nevertheless, climate per se um, is something they can respond to. They can adjust as, to, as sea level rises. And we go through a number of things. Um, so small scale, low latitude fisheries um, already have some concern. The Arctic region in general um, under quite a lot of threat. Terrestrial ecosystems, you can see it just, the threat level just gets bigger and bigger. Um, and, and so on and so forth. But it, it does make the point that really there are systematic impacts across a whole range of different systems, some of which are extremely vulnerable, some of which there is a bit more um, capacity in the system. But overall, it's quite a worrying picture. And um, also within that report, um, there was uh, reported a study about how much difference it made between one and a half degrees and two degrees of warming. And the, the risk to species for losing over um, half of their cl current climatic range. Now, there's lots of caveats around it, but um, it is quite a good indicator of the scale of threat. Um, so for insects, um, about 6% of species are liable to lose more than half of their currently suitable climatic range. It doesn't say whether they're going to be able to colonize new areas or not, but it, it's a good indicator of the level of threat. The really th key thing, though, is to look at the difference between the columns. So going from at 1.5 degrees of 6%, 2 degrees, 18% of insects um, at risk of losing more than half of their climatic range. And, and it's a similar pattern with the plants and the vertebrates. And at the large scale of, um, of, of whole biomes shifting and changing, so um, issues about tundra changing, um, being converted into, into forest or um, desertification and so on, you can see that at one and a half degrees, we might see one and a half percent. Sorry, at one and a half degrees, we might see four percent of land area changing biome. By the time it gets to two degrees, it's more like 18%. So 
So the key message here is that even half a degree really matters. I haven't shown the figure, but I'd also say if you live on a low-lying island, it, which you know people do, then it could be a matter of, uh, of literally whether your country survives or not. And, and it's no accident that small island states um, are some of the um, strongest proponents of strict action and strong action on climate change. So every half a degree matters. But um, having zoomed out to the uh, the global, I want to come back in again to to the to the local because uh, impacts are place and habitat specific, and we can see global patterns. But it's important we do look um, at our own individual situations. And I know for a lot of people on the call. Um, this is where it starts to become very real. So we've done an assessment working with our National Nature Reserve managers. And so for, um, I think something like 60 of our National Nature Reserves, we've asked site managers to do an assessment of what the risks are to their species, habitats and assemblages. And it's, the climate change specialists have supported them, have provided information, but it's been down to the site manager to actually make the assessment. And what you can see now in front of you is that um, we have a range of different climatic variables, temperatures, rainfall, extreme events in the round, and then a combination of all those factors put together and an assessment for different habitat types. And you can see them there, coastal, freshwater, grassland, heath, wetland, woodland, and upland. Um, the, a, a RAG rating, red indicates um, a high level of risk, um, amber a medium level, and green shows that you know, things aren't too bad. Um, and you can see, really, there is, when we look in combination, um, by their own assessment, we're looking at really more than half of the features for which natural nature reserves were designated in terms of species habitats or assemblages facing a degree of risk, um, which is quite sobering. We'll tell you next time what we're going to do about it or what, <laughs> what we should be doing about it, what we hope to do about it. Um, but for now, I think it, it, you know, it, it brings it home, that the, the risks are there. It also shows though that actually the risks are higher for some places than others. Um, uh, reflecting what we mentioned about the habitats, so the, the wetland and the, the upland ones, for example. Okay, so what are we doing? And now this is really just to introduce topics that we'll come back to in more detail. There's really two big approaches to responding to climate change, and it's not either or, we need both. One's called mitigation, one adaptation. Now mitigation sometimes causes confusion if you're not familiar with the climate change terminology and you're more familiar with it, for example, from development and planning. Mitigation in this case is tackling the causes of climate change, so reducing emissions or sequestering carbon. Um, Adaptation is dealing with the effects, what we can do to reduce vulnerability and what we can do to adjust to inevitable change. Um, in, the, in the early days, there was a lot of sort of uh, concern, I suppose, if you talk too much about adaptation, you're undermining the case for mitigation. I think, I think we've got away from that because the fact is the climate has already changed. We have to adapt. Um, it's not an optional extra. Um, but equally, we won't be able to adapt to some of the higher levels of change that we could face if there isn't ad adequate ad mitigation. So it's definitely both and, not either or. And um, I've mentioned 1.5 degrees, that's not um, arbitrary. The world is now committed to this uh, goal, to hold the global average temperature rise to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial, that's the Paris Agreement. Big achievement, very good, but how are we doing? And um, this is a, a rather sobering graphic. Um, which shows uh, where we are now. Uh, you can see the cursor on the screen, so nearly a degree of warming already. Uh, 1.5 degrees is here, what we want. 
current policies look like taking us somewhere about just over three degrees, but could be as much as 4.3 degrees of warming. Those that are uh, already pledged by the nations of the world, only, uh, you know, those, that enhanced sort of policy only takes you down just below three as an average, and it could be more than that. And even what are termed optimistic policies that are on the horizon uh, are about the same level. So there's clearly a lot more to do. Um, sobering fact for this morning. Here in the UK, um, it's, as well as in international um, convention law, it's, uh, it's not an optional extra. The Climate Change Act sets out for both adaptation, and this is the National Adaptation Programme on the left, uh, which was required by Climate Change Act, but also commitments um, to reduce carbon um, through a series of five yearly carbon budget budgets are, are again a legal requirement um, to, to bring down um, the uh, our contribution to climate change and the current um, longer or medium term objective is to reduce our net emissions um, to zero by 2050. We'll have more to say about that in two weeks' time, but that's a net zero commitment. Doesn't mean um, totally no emissions of greenhouse gases, but it means that those that are emissions must be balanced off by uh, removals of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, including, for example, by tree planting for tree growth. So I'm now coming to summing up and stopping. Um, and I wanted to end on a positive note, so I just wanted to show this slide of Bolton Fell Moss, um, which was a highly degraded peatland that had been mined for, for horticultural peat, essentially. Um, it's being restored, it's now a National Nature Reserve, and, and you know, it's, it's going in the right direction. So um, we'll talk about nature-based solutions as we go on, but, um, and, and it does have potential. It's only part of the solution. There's no getting away from the fact that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, massively. But nevertheless, restoring nature is part of the solution. So finally, some conclusions, then we'll open it up to some questions. So climate change is here and now. This isn't just a future issue. The risks, however, will increase in the future. We can see that species, habitats, and ecosystems are vulnerable, but we can reduce vulnerability. <clears throat> and nature is part of the solution. So do join us over the next three weeks. And um, Sarah, have we got any questions? Hello, yeah, we have got some questions. Thanks everyone for putting them in the chat. Um, the first set of questions came through about sea level rise. Um, so I, I, you know, rightly kind of identifying the fact that the the one meter sea level rise projected is, is massive, and it will have massive impacts on society and biodiversity. Humphrey was saying, thinks we should probably make more of that uh, in in our kind of communication and our work. Um, Humphrey also asked about the reasonable confidence. One. Oh, Sarah, I think we're uh, getting some background noise here. Yeah, maybe people are unmuting themselves. I don't know how. <laughs> uh, if you, could, did you hear the question that I asked? Uh, I got the first bit of it about um, one meter of sea level rise is massive and making more of it. What, what yeah. was the punchline? Or is that it? <laughs> what are our, the, do we have reasonable confidence limits around the one meter change? Both from Humphrey. Uh, do we, um, well, I, I mean, the, the one I showed, uh, if I can go back, no, I, I won't do that in the interest of time. Um, do we have reasonable confidence intervals? I mean, we do have confidence intervals, so, um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of, I mean, there's, there's a number of different causes of uncertainty, one of which, of course, is how much warming there is. Um, and it, 
that means that the, the bar, the error, the error bar increases as you go on towards the end of the century. Um, it could be more than a meter. I mean, it could be less, but it, it, that's sort of a midpoint. I mean, it, it, I think, as I recall, without looking at it, it's uh, of the order of probably, I don't know, 30, 40 centimetres either way. But, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a big impact. And it, it's, you know, certainly it's one we're feeling now. And it, it does vary in different parts of the UK. But, but you know, the, the, um, the East Anglian coast, it's a massive issue right now. Mm. And it's not going to get better any time soon. Yeah, so we can safely say we agree about making more of that limit. Oh, on sea level rise as well, um, Fran asked if anyone had produced a map which shows UK land cover after one metre sea level rise, and, and Kate very uh, very uh, helpfully shared floodmap.net. So if anyone's looking for that, have a look at that. Um, Kath has asked, can you give an example of evolutionary change that there is evidence for? Um the one that pops into my mind is uh, um, butterfly wing length, I think it was, or um, was it thorax size? I, um, I, I, I'm not sure why that pops into my mind, um, but there, there are some. They, they, they're quite specific and quite, quite detailed. Um, we, we can get back to you probably with a better example. I think um, Margaret shared a link in the chat to a journal paper that looks like it uh, looks at evolutionary change for black cat based on migration. So uh, have a look there. A very thank you. <coughs> for that. Um, so we had a uh, well. I think Ollie Watts was asking, uh, do we have any key messages for post 2020 CBD targets and approaches? Um. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, I'm just looking at the time here. I mean, I, I personally, I think um, the protection of existing uh, largely natural systems is, is a priority, always has been, always should be. Um, beyond that, though, I, I mean, large scale restoration, I think, and um, restoring ecosystems, particularly where they can provide multiple benefits um, would, would probably be top of my list. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of interest in the join up between the CBD targets, Convention on Biological Diversity targets, and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change targets, and, uh, and to find what sometimes termed the sweet spot, if you like, where, you know, where we we have limited resources, but where if we invest them well, where we can give most benefit for nature and for, for climate and people in the round. Uh, and I think something for me there about restoration um, of natural processes uh, where, where they've been hindered, in, including at the coast, which we talked about, um, lots of potential there in the UK for restoring coastal habitats, but also around the world and mangroves and so on in the right place can have lots of benefit. Great. I've got three more questions, so I'm gonna we're gonna I'm gonna try and ask them all, and a quick response, please, Mike, if that's okay. Uh, so Sophie asks, is there a way that we can use global trends to put our work in, put into perspective? For example, we have our own net zero report, which seems to be based on our own emissions, but will there come a time when we need to do more to make up for the lack of action across the globe? Um, well, we in the UK. Well, I mean, yes. <laughs> I think the times now, yeah, we, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a balance between it, between the national and the uh, international. Uh, and actually, you know, it's it, there is quite a well thought out system there. But you know, there's a lot of self interest going on in international negotiations and so on. Okay, um, from Isabel, uh, this is a good question and very timely or, or very uh, significant at the moment. Do you know if there's anything like the exercise Cygnus, which checked preparedness for a pandemic in 2016 for climate change? Neither policymakers nor most people seem to be taking it seriously enough. Um, well, there's the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment. That's the official statutory thing for the UK um, and at a global level. Um, you know, that's what every um, IPCC assessment report says. Um, I think the risks are well known, to be honest. 
I think the issue is the political acceptability of some of the choices they force upon us. But I think the actual risk assessment side, I, I think it's been done very thoroughly. It, it's the response to it. And arguably you could say there's some parallels there with, um, with viruses and pandemics. Um, and our last question, I think, looking at the time, does the Climate Change Act or net zero target restrict offsetting or nature-based solutions to the UK only, or might this be international offsetting? Um, I, oh, we might have to come back to that one. The, the climate it's largely UK. I'm trying to think what degree of international offsetting we can do. I, I, um, I mean, there is potential to offset internationally. Um, I, I think I'd need to look a little bit more closely at what offsetting arrangements are. But I mean, broadly speaking, we should be looking to do it within the UK. I, um, it's a big topic. <laughs> um, it's not so much in my experience. Sorry. Okay, well, we're coming back to net zero in a future webinar. And we're just like, I think we're, we're very nearly uh, at the end of the webinar. We've got quite a lot of um, useful sharing um, points on the chat as well. Thank you, everyone, for contributing there, both questions and um, answering each other's questions, giving information. That was really, really helpful. I'll capture all of that and save it um, and maybe send a few of those links around with the recording that we <coughs> and others that haven't managed to, to make it. Thanks very much, Mike, for presenting. That was really, really interesting. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Sorry to those that have had problems, um, but, um, yeah, we're, we're doing our best here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good week, everyone. Yeah, thanks, all.